Okay, once again, as the clock ticks, here's what we can expect to happen in the next few minutes. At T minus two minutes and 55 seconds, NASA will pressurize the liquid hydrogen tanks. At T minus two minutes, 35 seconds, the fuel cells will be readied. And at T minus one minute and 57 seconds, NASA will pressurize the liquid hydrogen tanks. And so right now there. we want to go back to Marcy Flesher, who is at the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Marcy, is the crowd there getting a little bit antsy? A little bit antsy. I think more excited than antsy. The anticipation is certainly building. We've ventured off our truck to join the hundreds that have gathered here on the lawn of the Astronaut Hall of Fame. I've got Stephen with me. You didn't come that far, just from Tampa. Why are you here today? Have you ever seen a shuttle live? Never seen a shuttle live at all. This is the first time. What are you expecting? A good, safe launch. It's very exciting. And seeing John Glenn go up again for him is absolutely fantastic. Okay, Stephen, I want to also introduce our viewers to some of the younger John Glenn fans who are here. Justin, where are you from? I'm from Orlando. Orlando, what do you think about all that's going on today? It's really freaky because people were coming here yesterday. It's pretty cool. And are you looking forward to this? Mm -hmm. What do you guys think it's going to sound like? Loud. Loud. And what do you think about all the excitement here today? Um, I don't know. I just want to see John Glenn go up again and um, yeah, just have fun. Okay, guys, there is a lot of fun here at the Astronaut Hall of Fame a Hall of Fame, kind of like a carnival atmosphere. Everybody watching their watches and knowing now that we're just 25 minutes out. Excitement continues to build. We've got a terrific view, just about 11 miles from you, Angela and Dave. All right, Marcy, thank you very much. We just found out that uh, earlier we were talking about Lisa Malone, the voice of NASA. We just found out that at T minus nine minutes, Dr. Sullivan, Scott Carpenter, who is one of Glenn's Mercury 7 astronaut um, buddies, is going to have a very special message for Senator Glenn then. That's T minus nine minutes, shuttle discovery countdown. And it's really symbolic because it was Scott Carpenter that said, you know, Godspeed, Godspeed John, John Glenn, Glenn during the first flight in the Mercury. Let's go to the Ohio State University now and Lisa Kick. Lisa, what's happening there? Uh, in Bricker Hall, the OSU Men's Glee Club is seeing to us getting everyone excited for this big mission. Listen in for just a little bit. Very fitting as our senator and astronaut John Glenn makes his second trip into space as the oldest man in the world to ever go into space. Really just some excitement building here at Ohio State just within the last 20 minutes or so, you guys. We have a nice crowd on hand now of students and staff, and we'll be checking back in with you and letting you know about their reaction to all of this. Folks are starting to get even more excited now as we inch closer to liftoff. <laughs> we all are, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you very much. Lisa Kick reporting from OSU. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Live from the Kennedy Space Center, 10TV Eyewitness News presents Countdown to Discovery, John Glenn's Return to Space. And we welcome you back to Cape Canaveral here for the space flight and the space flight and John Glenn's Return to Space. All right, and we are going to listen in then to NASA select the mission control now that we are inside the 10-minute mark. But first, right now, we want to go to Dr. Catherine Sullivan, our resident expert. What is happening right now inside of 10 minutes? Uh, we're counting down the last few seconds till a built-in hold at nine minutes. Uh, our understanding is that there'll be a, an interesting and special message to the crew by Scott Carpenter, who uh, said the original goodbye to John Glenn 36 years ago. And then the team will go through the rest of its normal status checks, final verification. Everybody's really ready to take a deep breath and focus. And you think this is the busiest time then? Yeah, all the busy and important things get checked more often and more precisely from here on in. Just about to go into the hold, let's listen to NASA Select. And cl countdown clock is now holding at the T minus nine minute mark. Again, this is a planned built and hold, the last planned one for our countdown today for STS-95. We are pleased to be joined this afternoon by another of NASA's original seven Mercury astronauts, Scott Carpenter. And he has a special message for the crew aboard Discovery. Yes, at this point, 
in the count. It seems appropriate to say to the shuttle discovery crew, good luck, have a safe flight, and to say once again, Godspeed, John Glenn. Okay, that was Carpenter served as Glenn's backup for the Scott Carpenter. He was located in the Complex 14 blockhouse just a few hundred yards away from the launch pad at Cape Canaveral Air Station. Carpenter was in communication with Glenn for the last 18 seconds of the launch countdown and moments before the launch uttered to Glenn the immortal words which have since been etched into history. Scott Carpenter uh, again is here at Kennedy Space Center watching the launch of his once uh, fellow crewmate of one of the original seven. We have two of the, all three of the surviving original seven are here at Kennedy Space Center. Of course, John Glenn uh, patiently awaiting the launch of the shuttle Discovery and uh, just uh, less than uh, 20 minutes away now. For the cabin bleed down and that's the, uh, the only one we reach as far as we know. All right, we were listening to the voice of Lisa Malone, Mission Control. Dr. Sullivan, it must be a real rush then for these Mercury 7 astronauts, the remaining three, to be able to be here to wish Godspeed to their, their uh, old astronaut buddy. I, I think you're right, Angela. Just seeing them around here last night and today, uh, they're clearly pretty pumped about this, excited for John, uh, maybe a bit nostalgic themselves. and. Uh, not all of them get down for all the shuttle launches, so I think they're probably also enjoying watching a shuttle launch, which is very different than the Mercury Redstone they remember. I thought it was interesting to note that after they, they played over the PA system, uh, the, uh, the message of uh, the Scott Carpenter, and there was applause that uh, you could hear in the background all the way up uh, the, the media yeah. tents and even lined up here on Banana Creek over here. Yeah, I thought he, Scott did that very nicely. The tradition, of course, is to wish Godspeed and a safe flight to the mission commander and the entire crew. And, 36 years ago, that was John. That's right. That, he was the only one the only in the guy. capsule there. So I think now All we're right. going to go to Robin Simmons, who is in New Concord, Ohio, hometown of John Glenn. Robin? We are, Angela, and I can tell you that there is no excitement that would match what is going on in here. 800 students all attending John Glenn High School who are gathered here in the gym to see what's going to happen just about 15 minutes from now. And we want to kind of give you a flavor of what was going on in New Concord today. Excitement in John Glenn's hometown is at a fever pitch. From the flags proudly flying all over town to well-wishers watching history unfold on live television, the fever is contagious, even crossing state lines. We decided that we would uh, t take time on this trip back to stop and see some of these things. And so that's what we're doing. <laughs> Charlotte Holmquist and her husband Fred are on their way back to Minnesota. Their stopover in New Concord today was pure coincidence. And of course, the most important place here in New Concord, a living shrine to Glen, 186 Friendship Drive, Glen's boyhood home the street renamed for Friendship 7. Although she's an out-of-towner, Charlotte no, I... speaks for everyone here who's just happy to be a part of this historical day. Goodness, this is what life is about. And what life is about here at John Glenn High School, getting ready for the launch. And I pulled one of the students aside, Emily Tuttle, a sophomore here. What do you think about this whole thing? I think it's pretty exciting. It's a good learning experience for us as students, and hopefully it can help for age-related problems. Hopefully it can lead to some discoveries for treatment of problems. Going to a school that's named after this guy, I mean, creating history for a second time. I mean, how does that make you feel? I think it's just pretty exciting. It's pretty nice to know that somebody from a small town can make it big and be as successful as he has been. Wonderful. You heard it there. One of the students from John Glenn's hometown here in New Concord, just as proud as she can be, and everyone here is as proud as they can be that John Glenn is from this area and never forgot it and always comes back, Angela. Uh, he is their favorite son, Robin. Thank you very much. 
and we take a look at the countdown clock we find out we are still in that nine minute hole but they're telling us we have about five minutes left in this nine minute hole and angela talking to Catherine sullivan a few moments ago she was indicating to us that this is the kind of movies the right stuff the right stuff for the movie that everything is happening Can't real you quickly just see huh? tom hanks yeah. right now in mission control <laughs> because things now go click 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 as dr sullivan said this is when the Very pace quickly. really picks up yeah. and we get into this serious serious pre-launch phase you're looking at the shuttle discovery there poised ready to go back in just a moment stay with us you're watching mission discovery special coverage from 10 tv eyewitness news and the ohio news network with 10 tv's dave kaler angela pace and onn's deborah knapp video right there of the crew of STS-95, that's the shuttle Discovery, as they walked out of crew quarters, about to get on that big aero stream to be shuttled over to the shuttle. This happened about 11 o'clock this morning, and uh, they had a few of the, uh, the big wheels, too, of NASA were on there, and then they, they take it partway out, and then they let the big wheels off, and then they take the rest of them down to the to, to the pad. And, and it, uh, it was really quite yeah, thrilling to watch them getting off the bus and going on to, uh, going up yeah, into yeah, the, the shuttle itself. Right there here. you're seeing them being strapped in. And it's really quite a process too. There's Senator Glenn being strapped in for his second mission into space. I wonder what's going through his mind. You know, he's a very modest individual, Angela, as you know. We've talked to him many times. Right. But you look at that resume, and it is absolutely, it is the resume of a hero. You can't get around it. There's no way, shape, or form. But he's very humble and very modest about it. But I think that right now, he's probably like a kid at Christmas time. So? This is what he, he has wanted is. for 36 years. He always wanted that second mission. So now, here is his opportunity to prove that he does have the right stuff. We understand right now that there is some kind of a delay. Let's Let's talk to Dr. Kathy Sullivan right now. Yeah. Have you been able to hear what the delay is about? Uh, they're still diagnosing the delay. It, it may well be kind of minor. They had a, a master alarm trigger in the cockpit associated with the cabin vent. That just occurred a few minutes ago. They're going to extend the nine-minute hold while they look at that and see what uh, the determination is. What is the cabin vent? What, what well, you, as that? you know, inside the front end of the orbiter there, there's a pressure vessel that holds in one atmosphere worth of Florida air for the crew during launch and, in fact, the whole mission. Should the cabin ever get overpressured with a, a pressurization tank leaking into it, you want that air to be able to get out somewhere. So there are valves that let that cabin vent, that cabin atmosphere vent if need be. Do they check this out with their software, through the computer? They did some How checks, did uh, yes, it's flagged by the computer. This is part of the system they checked just at the time that they closed the hatch to make sure that the cabin will both seal and the vent valves right. will work as expected. Uh, it's not expected to have a master alarm trigger at this point, so they're going to stop and just make sure they understand it. And uh, All right, we let's can listen, listen to NASA right Select and see what they've got on Sullivan. it. Quite possibly the environmental control systems folks on the launch control team are still consulting their computer readouts and looking at the detailed technical indicators. Uh, these are folks who understand all of the engineering and the physics of the orbiter, so if they have an indicator that's faulty, they'll be able to deduce that in most cases. What's the percentage of that happening? Oh, it's uh, of, an, of a failure or an anomaly at this point in time. It's really fairly small mm -hmm. overall. And uh, quite often those are resolved because, again, the team can deduce from its technical expertise uh, that it's a false sensor or a false indicator and not a real problem. Somebody looking at this picture for the very first time, what is the steam, or uh, somebody would describe it as smoke coming out of the bottom of the orbit? We're continuing to hold as engineers That's, discuss um, and evaluate. Those are the, the vent fumes from the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen inside the orangish-yellow external fuel tank there. Lisa Malone's explaining the current situation a bit for us. Let's listen. When the Discovery crew module door was installed and secured for flight, as a matter of routine, the cabin vents and will be slowly, and the whole crew cabin is slowly pressurized from its normal sea level pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch up to a few more pounds per square inch. And as the pressure increases, the environmental control engineer here in the farm room monitors the status of the test. The higher the normal pressure in the crew module causes alarms in the cabin to go off, this serves as a test of the orbiter's caution and warning system.
anxiety at this point on the part of the crew at this time, Dr. Sullivan, or not? Uh, probably not intense anxiety. A uh, little curiosity as to what the launch control team will deduce from their indicators. They can see more data about the systems than the crew can see on board in this in this case. And maybe a little anxiety that they'd sure like to... They, yeah. It's eight and a half minutes to get comfortable if you yeah. leave the pad straight up. It's a lot longer if you have to get out of the vehicle and drive back home and unsuit. So yeah. you never want to ask the crew at this point what their opinion is of the nature <laughs> of a problem and whether you should go or not, because they, they are very, say, they're unanimously going to want to go. They're ready to go. Right. And of course, Regardless. the shuttle does not have to lift off exactly at 2 o'clock, though that is planned. They have that two-hour window of opportunity. And with the weather the way that it is right now, that is not going to be well, a negative factor. That's right. They also need to have weather uh, favorable at uh, some overseas sites mm -hmm. in case there was an abort during flight, but those appear also to be in very good shape, so uh, they probably can use the whole two and a half hour window. We do have a two and a half hour launch window today. Just we're talking okay. about. We it. expect we will be clearing this problem up very shortly, as we continue to hold at the T minus nine minute mark. All other systems aboard Discovery are continuing to look very good at this point. Weather looking very good for today's launch. We had a similar sort of problem with an indicator crop up on one of my flights with the countdown clock held at 31 seconds. Oh. At that point, you have auxiliary power units and other things running that really limit the amount of time you can sit still and think about it. And uh, I got to tell you, one of the most uh, exciting and motivating and proud moments of my life was listening to this team of launch controllers go through its paces, think through the physics of the system, no changed pitch in the voice, no anxiety or pressure in the room analyze the situation, advise the NASA test director that they understand the problem and they can switch the software over and we can proceed. And because we flew they those folks to, to the Cape. All we right. flew those folks to the landing site after that flight because they were the only reason <laughs> oh, there was a landing that That was day. the very yeah. least you could do, Absolutely. I would think. You know, we were talking about the steam coming out of the, the bottom of the, um, the coming the vapors, rather, coming out of the bottom of the shuttle. Earlier today, you were telling us about the beanie, as you called it, yes. on the top. You can see a little white, what's called beanie cap, at the very tip of the external tank. And some of the main vents for flight fumes di flight in that Linda shroud Hammond, get Houston pulled just off confirming with the launch from team there. She also saw the three master alarms as expected when the pressure was brought up inside Discovery's crew module. And we expect a discussion to, to follow soon. You hear now the critical interface and handover between Houston and Kennedy. Uh, you can't launch the vehicle with the two control centers having a different understanding of what condition it's in, of what's happening, of whether things behaved as expected. The orbiter clears the tower in about seven seconds. So seven seconds after ignition, the flight control team in Houston catches that forward pass on the run accelerating 2,000 miles an hour every minute that the engines are burning. Wow. So you really want to be in sync with your partners Absolutely. in Florida. Oh, yeah. They have to know right now everything that is going on. That's right. Does, there, does it come down to a case of one control room having the final say? Does Kennedy then outrank Houston? The, uh, the responsibility to follow the launch commit criteria lies with the launch control team Man, here so in Florida. So uh, now Houston, both teams are a part of formulating those and sharing the technical for understanding sure, uh, that default. they're based on. But at the end of the day, the responsibility for saying, I'm no go for flight, because the problem happened at this point in time, it would lie with the environmental control system officer in the launch control center across the way. Here? Here. Okay. You mentioned your own shuttle flight that was delayed at 31 seconds. What other kinds of little glitches like this then Test can conductors make? just verifying the shuttle the just have to sit on the pad crew while you try to flight and also uh, Sometimes you wait for weather if there's some the variable data, wind or some cloud or fog evolving. Again, this is the uh, then you might try to wait out the weather if the launch window allows you. Sometimes an indicator as we had, as perhaps is the case here. I just okay, heard I copy that. Something. Okay. Crank along. Ground launch sequence officer. And CISL, JRPS, keep the flight entity on 212. Activate ops recorder, CISL. It uh, sounds from JRPS. these conversations JRPS. like JRPS. they're get, perhaps getting ready to pick keep back the flight. up we'll the, put it in work. the countdown. Copy. Attention all stations, this is the NTD performing the launch status check. So it could be a faulty entity. This count. is the NASA tech launch. director Take now no, polling go. his controllers. Go. TDC. Tank and boosters are go. TTC. Go. LPS. Up yes, let's go. Flight. Flight's go. Myla. Myla's go. SPM. Go. Safety console. Safety console go. SPE. SPE is go. LRD. LRD is go. SRO. SRO is go. You have range clear to launch. I copy. And CDR. 
Discovery's go. Very good. And launch director NTE, the launch team is ready to proceed. Okay, I'll perform my poll at this time. Engineering. Now, are you as a crew member hearing all of this inside yes, the Yes, the crew module? is following these status checks. Okay. This is Station really when you start to get uh, ready Safety to go. Safety mission assurances go, Ralph. Payload processing. Payloads are go. Cape weather. Roger, sir. We have no constraints for launch. Ops manager. MMT is go for launch. The engineering, one more time. Oh, this is, this is exciting, though. No, it really is. Uh, we've been listening here to the uh, NASA test director and uh, the launch director. There are several officials involved in this point. The NASA test director is the NASA official go, go. in the firing yeah, room. Uh, we are uh, okay, engineering. up all. They're looking for the chief of engineering to speak up and stake their claim. Silence is not an option at this point. You're responsible for understanding the status of what you're what you're dealing with. Let's entity on two one two. We will be resuming the count momentarily. Okay, they're going to pick up the clock here. So apparently we've they are remained in okay. the built-in hold an additional eight and a half minutes so far. So I've completed my poll. We are go. All right, thank you. Did you all launch director? Go ahead, launch director. Okay, the launch team is go. Your vehicle's ready. Uh, the weather's beautiful out there. On behalf of the entire launch team, you and the crew at Discovery have a great mission. All right. Good. That sounds, sounds good. like the Thank uh, you very much, sir. The okay Discovery's crew is definitely ready to go, and uh, we would like you to proceed. Wow. NTD, uh, pick up the camera. Okay, and looking... I copy that launch director. CISO NTD. CISO. Up to reporter activation complete. You know, I don't know if you can see... Not yet. What are all these buses okay, behind us? Trying to pick up the hold at nine, you know? Dave, I, I would imagine those Copy are just that. tour groups and, and media station. groups that are out here at the various viewing sites. Okay. There, uh, NTD is going to pick up the NTD clock here on your mark. just a second. CLS copy. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. And we resume the count. No, we're now at T minus nine minutes and counting. And applause. We heard the NASA test director. Applause. The group out the launch here team as the countdown does resume. Launch director conducting a poll of his team. And we will be back and with uh, more of our shuttle Jonathan discovery Harris. coverage in just a second. I got the sweaty palms. So located here in the firing room. Live from the Kennedy Space Center, 10 TV Eyewitness News presents Countdown to Discovery. John Glenn's return to space. There's going to be a hold. We have an aircraft uh, that we can't find. Okay, I copy that. There's going to be a hold at T minus five minutes. Sort of hold at five, five minutes. minutes. And why is that? It's an aircraft in the launch area. count will hold at the T minus five now, minute mark. No the range zone. safety officer reported an aircraft here? in the area. We need to locate that aircraft and escort it out of the flight path of the vehicle. telling us earlier, the only aircraft allowed in this area yeah, two are, and a half hour of course, those today. sanctioned by NASA. So, uh, these momentary holds uh, will not affect anything on board the shuttle Discovery, and the crew is... Is this an aircraft that might want to get a picture, or somebody just doesn't know any better, or just... Didn't read the notice to airmen, yeah. mindless, okay. touristing... Thank you, let's confirm anyway. that a hold is uh, in place at five minutes. Correct. The countdown clock will hold at T minus five minutes due to NTE hold request. This has yeah. got to be oh, so wow. nerve wracking. All these little things. I mean, we know that they're important. It's important to check everything out, but still, to you're stop just the clock, very eager to go, uh, and you just sit there listening and hoping it's a legitimate problem. Fix it. T minus five minutes and holding. T minus five. The countdown clock is holding at T minus five minutes. I spent about nine minutes Again, in the, the range safety hole. officer monitoring the airspace within the Kennedy Space Center and vicinity reporting an aircraft in the minutes. area. Well, the range uh, attempts to uh, resolve their issue. Please stand by. That's our ONT, NTD. Just incredible. That's our ONTD on two one two. The 
back and you see it sitting there, it's just, it's just, uh, what a picture. Once again, in case you have just joined us, we are now at T minus five minutes, Dr. Sullivan, and holding. The launch team here will stand by, waiting for the superintendent of range operations, known as SRO, to give the final clear for launch. Again, an aircraft in the area. We will have to hold and wait for that aircraft to move out of the vicinity of Kennedy Space Center so that uh, the shuttle Discovery can safely lift off Dr. and have a clean flight path. And that is Lisa Malone of NASA. There's what is the perimeter? Do you know what the perimeter the is? The auxiliary power unit. Uh, it varies a little bit with each elevation uh, and each specific and path, Dave. They clear an entire corridor out to sea so that the solid rocket boosters can drop so. back in so there's no hazard to boats or aircraft. And occasionally, a, some boat or airplane strays into that area, maybe not out. paying attention, maybe a little too eager for a photograph. The uh, range safety folks that you're hearing Lisa refer to is another, yet another component of the launch control team whose job it is to sanitize that airspace and keep an eye on it, make sure there's nobody in there that uh, could be at some risk. And they have the authority, as does any of the controllers, to put their hand up in the air and say, I've got a problem, we're not going until it's fixed. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. The countdown clock at this point doesn't stop at just any old point. There's predefined points in time so that everybody has a common understanding of what state are all the systems in. If we go forward, what do I need to do? If we were to back up from here, what would I need to do? So he actually requested this hold about a minute and a half ago, and they just let the clock run down to this defined point and then sit there. Okay. If they come out of this hold with the aircraft cleared away, the next step for the crew will be to start the onboard auxiliary power units. And, uh, that's kind of a point of no return almost, isn't it? Uh, it's a very, that's right, it's a very yeah. critical point. You begin using SRO, the fuel within the auxiliary power Burn units themselves, and you need, you need those again for entry and landing. Your so you're not going to spend sir, too much of it on the launch pad uh, and risk having enough fuel left for the landing and phase. So they'll be watching that very and, uh, carefully. There's usually the about a 14 to 16 minute time frame that you can run the APUs before you get into that box. Range safety uh, in the background is talking to the NASA test director and just giving him an update that it, at this point they can't project when they might clear the range. So. Now when we, we were talking about when we saw the pictures earlier when they were closing the hatch and you said everybody's just pretty cool. Now I would think that the anxiety is a little bit different in module than it was maybe an hour ago. Huh? Um, well, I think you might be a little surprised. It's uh, I, certainly on all the crews that I was on, uh, such great confidence in this team. You've worked with them a number of times. You know them. You know they know their stuff. Uh, you're in no position to second guess or, or uh, rethink what they're proposing. And there's you nothing just, you can do to change yeah. the circumstances. You're strapped so in and you just do you it. You sit there and wait and see what happens. You're anxious to go. Uh, it's a whole lot more fun for the rest of the day if you launch and get to start your part of the job. Uh, but there's a lot of respect and understanding between the different parts of the team. Uh, what are we looking at here now? We're looking in uh, what looks like the port side window from the pad uh, into Kurt Brown's window. Sometimes if you get the light just right with those pad cameras, you can see the, the helmet or the gloves of the crew member inside. And this is a little more distant shot. Uh, you know, when you start, uh, when you get into the real serious business of all of this, starting the main engines and then starting the solids, that surface of the pad that uh, Discovery is mounted on, it's actually deluged with water. So uh, you'll probably see the NASA signal cut away in the final stages of launch to the base of the orbiter and the pad surface so that we can see several of those key events that are uh, precursors and associates of starting the main engines, presuming we get out of our range safety hole here. <laughs> yes, we've got to get that aircraft out of the way right now. Security, of course, is always tight for a lot of these shuttle launches, but especially this one because it has attracted so much attention because there are so many dignitaries here and um, because it is such a special launch for John Glenn. President Clinton is here, I understand the Crown Prince of Spain is here. There are multiple targets, and this time the radar is saturated. They're working. No, they're still still working that problem. Yeah, I copy that. And again, please keep us advised. Yeah, there are. There's a very large congressional delegation right. here. Angela, yeah. heads of state, P Pedro Duque is uh, obviously receiving great fanfare in his home country of Spain. Let's talk about him a little bit because were it not for Senator John Glenn hitching a ride on this shuttle, Pedro Duque would probably be the star because this is his very first, first. mission and he is the first Spaniard right. to go on a shuttle mission. He, uh, he really is about to be the Alan Shepard of Spain, mm -hmm. the very first nationality to, to fly in, in space in any form. He's got a very uh, 
very interesting and very strong technical background in the European Space Agency and a lot of engineering and technical roles. And I was talking to some of my colleagues around the site last night. Um, very uh, genteel, laid back kind of guy. Uh, has uh, handled with just superb grace and graciousness the arrival of John and, hold and, and any just, sort uh, of uh, deflection of attention yeah, it might have cost him. Mark. And I suspect down the road somewhere he realizes that uh, in the long run, the kind of sea story he'll tell about his first space flight yeah, will have some extra distinctive features to it because he, he was one of the crew that took John uh, along on the flight. He's a, Pedro's a mission specialist, of course, so he has a very different scope of responsibilities than John has, much more involved in the manipulator systems and the orbiter systems. But he does have a fan club. You spotted someone with a Pedro Duque t-shirt on a That's little right. while ago. Well, and the European Space Agency made up a specialized uh, patch yeah. to celebrate the first Spaniard to fly. A very, uh, very fun, dramatic patch. And you see that around very proudly displayed by the European Space Agency folks. Yeah. While, we, while we have some time here and, and we're waiting and we're in this hole and apparently they just, they indicated that, you know, they'll wait for two hours if they have to. They'll to use this, the entire window here yeah, as long as the APUs aren't started. Um, what what does this flight really mean for the future of NASA and, and the International Space Station? I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of controversy in the country and a lot of different people, you know, who say don't spend right. the money and do spend the money and don't spend the money. I don't see the value in it. Some people say they do see the value in it. Well, I, I guess my opinion would be listening to a number of the, the general public and the younger folks that we've heard over the last day and a half. Um, Boy, there sure is some value to me that the young folks in this country know that mm -hmm. they live in a place that is about daring and dreams and reaching and changing boundaries, expanding limits, uh, and believing that you can do the impossible. Uh, I had classmates that came from backgrounds that one would never have suspected should attain the acclaim and technical competency of an astronaut, and they did. It mattered to all of us to see John and his colleagues in the Mercury days doing these extraordinary things no one had ever done before. It told us something about the scope of possibilities we could dream about and prepare ourselves to make happen, to be a part of. So this flight is, as many flights the are, just one little building block. Every Mercury flight forward. was one little building block Those towards Apollo. Every Gemini launch. flight. Right. Hubble Space Telescope serving e servicing equipment is being tested on this flight that'll be critical to the third servicing mission coming up in about a year. Uh, several robotics and support techniques Debra that will be used in the assembly of the space station are being tested here. The uh, some very interesting solar physics and astronomy are being done here. And then the medical and biomedical experiments that John is a part of. So it's a very elaborate flight that really challenged the mission designers quite, quite severely to get it all woven together and make everything play together so that you could satisfy all the scientific requirements through the course of a nine-day mission. And when you talk about all those experiments, it seems that back when John Glenn and Alan Shepard and Scott Carpenter were going into space, it was a happening. And shuttle missions have become pretty routine now. In fact, the shuttle astronauts themselves, they say, well, it's, we're going to work. It's, it's just uh, another day at work. So will this kind of pump some more excitement, you think, into the program? I, I think for a moment it will pump some more excitement. I, mean, I, I think uh, if you really probe people in the program about shuttle flights they've, or space flights, they've definitely become more frequent. But I can promise you there's not any flight that's routine. So it'll never be routine. Uh, and you're hearing some of that here. Gee, you yeah, would think you could right. just start the clock right. and tiki-boo right. right on down. It's never that simple. Uh, there's always something, hopefully little, that challenges your technical expertise and your ability to work together as a team. So. The interesting thing about this mission also is it has young people excited. Angela, the, uh, the range safety officer has just announced that the range is clear for off for launch, and the NASA test director should be picking up the count shortly. That has got to be good news for folks on top, sitting on top of that director. So you are just joining us. That was a violation of the airspace, and, and that's the why they uh, held the count down at T minus five minutes. Countdown clock will pick up momentarily. TLS, pick up the count on your mark. TLS, copy. Three, two, one, mark. TLS, go. go for orbiter AP wow. start. Yeah. DLT, OTC, perform APU start. Again, applause. Applause, yeah. <laughs> it's, this is just work. unreal. Crew is not the only group that oh, wants exactly. this to happen. PDR, exactly. There are folks easier. who have traveled from a long way away and waited a long time PDR, to see this. PDR, copy, Peter, take and work. The uh, pilot, or PLT as he's called on the voice loops, is starting the auxiliary power units now. And OTC, heater reconfigure and, uh, complete. Various heaters and copy. environmental control systems are being set up. T minus four minutes, 30 seconds. 
this point. Uh, from this point on, as we listen to Lisa, you'll now hear an increasing number of events associated with the main engine. Lindsay will report back when the APUs have no. he's seen an indication they have a good start. I know you told me I should keep my camera in and just enjoy the, the pulse and, and the sensation and the vibration. Okay, but, um, David, there are 100,000 people here with cameras better than yours, but none of them can feel what you might feel. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, so I am going to just, emotion, no, Kayla. I am just going to sit here emotion. and let this, she says it's going to vibrate yeah. through your toes and your chest to the whole works. I'm just going to sit here and enjoy it then. You'll never outshoot the tracking mounts with that's a right. handheld camera. <laughs> that's that's Final true. Final quarter sequence of the main engines will begin right. in about 30 seconds. So I'll just buy the poster then, right? That's probably the right thing to do. <laughs> it's uh, going to start getting the interesting flight control here. systems are being just moved to the base of the pad. You feel these vibrations aboard. You feel the main Pattern engines gimbal. They will be verified. They are ready for there launch. There you see a move. The three main engines are being gimbled and positioned for launch. What does gimbal mean? Just moved through their range of motion. All you systems are go for launch at this time, just a few minutes engines. away from the 25th voyage of Discovery with a crew right, of seven. Movement there. Mm. ELS will hold at minus 31 seconds due to a failure indication. Hold. Oh. Okay, there's going to be another hold at 31 seconds. That's the point where the ground launch sequencer usually hands over to redundant set. Haven't heard yet why. Again, this was the issue we described earlier. This is a known condition. Okay. Okay. As Lisa will probably explain to us, that just an indicator that uh, was providing inaccurate data. Clear caution, warning, memory, verify, no unexpected errors. Copy that, and work. Just a couple seconds here. The crew will close their visors. MPS engine two pitch, actuator profile, verified nominal. CLC is go for launch. And CLC has been what getting a that? copy. Go it's for the beanie launch. cap retracting. It's coming back. Break, break, MPDSR on 212. <sighs> go ahead, SRO. Yes, sir. Uh, we will need to hold the clock. Range is no go. We have a valve range. Okay, the I range. Copy that, and we'll hold at T minus 31 seconds and be advised our hold time there is 5 minutes and 18 seconds. Range understands hold time of 5 minutes 18 seconds. Let's listen to Lisa explain the two things that are happening OTC, here. CPLT, caution warning clear, no expected error. Stop. Countdown clock will be holding. The superintendent of range operations announcer is... Uh, remove the hold in association with our engine two pitch and insert a hold at T-minus 31 seconds due to the range. ELS copies and works. 31 seconds is one of those like planned OTC, hold points. Close and lock your visors, initiate O2. The uh, engine the actuator the issue that we talked about earlier, Angela, they have resolved the that. That's no longer a reason to hold at 31 seconds, but the range safety uh, officers uh, have a problem. We'll the and go to 2 -2. You can see Kurt Brown moving around there. Break, break, NTD, SRO on 212. Two. Good, SRO. Yes, sir, ranges go for launch. The range is All clear. right, it's cleared again. I copy that. Launch director, NTD. Here we go. Let's go. And GLS, please remove the hold at T-minus 31. Copy and work. T-minus one minute and counting. With 29 seconds to go, GLS will move so quickly they won't even let the countdown clock stop. All systems are go. All systems have been reported go for launch of Discovery. Less than one minute away now from the historic return of John Glenn to space. I copy and attention all stations. The we'll countdown clock will continue. Home, but it is uh, something else here. Lisa will probably give us a real good walk through this final crisp sequence of events. Okay. VLS is go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers now have control of vehicle functions. T minus 20 minutes, 20 seconds. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for engine start. Five, four, three, uh, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew oh. of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Hey, good line. So that's oh, what Lisa yeah. was going to say. Discovery, Look at that. It's like program. a candle. Roger roll, Discovery. Oh, my God. <laughs> was I right? Yeah.
speed. Uh, What's it like flying like that sense of flying upside down? You don't really feel that very much. You're so, uh, the force pushing across your body back into the seat is so much stronger, Dave. They, uh, and the they'll... external tank should be coming off soon? Uh, the, oh, no, the external tank won't come off uh, until very late in the profile. The solid rockets will come off at about two minutes and four solid, seconds. I'm sorry, the solid rockets. That's right. Yeah. They, uh, they throttle down at about uh, 48 seconds to get through the maximum dynamic pressure range. Uh, then they come back and throttle up. You heard that call. And separation is coming up now. Wow. The next event will be burnout and separation of Discovery's twin solid rocket boosters. There go the solids. There it goes. And I think what a lot of people don't realize, Dr. There, Sullivan, six is that, more minutes to go. Yeah. Those rocket boosters then are reusable. Yes, those rocket those rocket casings land in the ocean and are used again. You'll hear the Susan Still informing the crew that in the event of a single engine failure. Performance nominal. Things are going good. Copy, performance nominal. Discovery could now reach the transatlantic abort site at Banjul. However, telemetry indicating all three engines continuing to perform well. And Discovery's performance to this point, two and a half yes. minutes into the flight, has been as expected. Woo. Discovery now traveling at a speed of 3,500 miles per hour at an altitude of 43 miles. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 70 miles. All systems are continuing to perform well. In just about another 45 seconds, they'll be going so fast they can't turn around and come back here, and you'll hear Susan still call negative return. Three minutes into the flight, Discovery now traveling at a speed of 3,850 miles per hour, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center at a distance of 86 miles. And how many abort sites are there around the world? Just about five minutes of powered flight remaining on board. There are uh, three transatlantic aborts on the continent, primarily the continent of Africa, North Africa, and then you can also go almost a full revolution around the Earth and land in California if you need to. And that's at Edwards? That would be uh, at Edwards for this Edwards flight. Yeah. They should be coming up on negative return here shortly. And Lisa will actually make that announcement. Three minutes and 40 seconds into the flight, Discovery now traveling at a speed of 4,600 miles per hour. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, just about 135 miles. Telemetry indicating that all systems on board are... Con negative return. Discovery copies negative return. That means they... they couldn't and with that back. call, Discovery is now too far downrange and it's gained too much altitude to return to the Kennedy Space Center in the event of an engine failure. Discovery Houston, press to ATO. I'd stay at least one more minute. Discovery copies, press to ATO. And Discovery could now reach orbit on two engines should one fail. However, telemetry continues to indicate that all three main engines are performing at 104% of rated thrust as expected. Four minutes, 21 seconds into the flight, just about four more minutes of powered flight remaining. Discovery traveling at a speed of 5,700 miles per hour, downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 200 miles. This is a very gentle ride for John. He had over 7 Gs last time. In about three minutes, he'll get to close to 3 Gs, but just below that, they actually throttle the shuttle's main engines to stay below 3 okay. Gs so that the payloads don't have to be so strong, not for the human beings. So okay. this is a very easy ride for John if he remembers his first one. It's still a very good ride. <laughs> In just a moment, we should hear Susan still uh, let them know. Five minutes into the mission, three and a half minutes of powered flight remaining. They hit a point here where they, Houston, press to Miko. they would press on the main engine cutoff even Discovery if they lost copies, an engine. Press to Miko. And that call means that Discovery could now reach a safe orbit on two engines should one fail. All three main engines are continuing to perform. Discovery Houston, single engine op three, Banjo. Discovery copies, single engine op three, Banjo. Discovery now at a speed of 7,600 miles per hour, <laughs> downrange from the Kennedy Some. Space Center, 308 miles. All systems on board are continuing to perform well. Just about three minutes of powered flight remaining. Did you ever get from North America to Africa in eight minutes? No, never did. Discovery, I can get up 315 Banjo, pretty fast, but uh, nothing compared to this. Discovery copies, single engine Banjo 104. With you all know, three main engines still up and running on board at Discovery, that call was that Discovery could make it to the transatlantic abort site at Banjul in the event that two engines should fail, but all three engines are continuing to perform as expected. Discovery now downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 385 miles, traveling at a speed of 9,100 miles per hour and an altitude of just about 68 miles. That'd be a reason to stay through Miko. Oh, okay. So there could actually be 
communication from the shuttle how right. soon? Uh, there's been communication from the shuttle to the CAPCOM throughout powered flight. You'll hear these calls back and forth mm -hmm. from Susan Still to Kurt. Uh, it's not uncommon that when you cut off the engines, the commander... Discovery will... Houston, single engine press 104. Okay. Discovery copy, single engine press 104. Kurt will report back Six minutes and the velocity seconds into cutoff. the flight, traveling yeah, at the speed of 10,000 miles per hour. Houston has control now. That's what I want to do. Now okay. reach. Lisa's commenting, but Houston has control. To fail. No. However, right, all, all three engines are still performing at 104% of rated all, thrust. All this computer talk, and I'm reminded of, of, of John Glenn, what he said this summer. He says, all these guys are computer geeks, and I'm just in the email well, stage. There was no <laughs> onboard computer in Freedom 7. There are five here plus 13 laptops. So. <laughs> no. Well, he'll be a whiz at this by the time he comes back on the 6th. Oh, man. Over seven or, minutes and ten <laughs> seconds into the flight, Discovery's Ooh. engines will soon begin to throttle back to maintain structural limits on the orbiter as it approaches... Loads near three times normal gravity. Discovery now traveling at the rate of 12,000. You might get a comment from John hour, right after range Miko. From the Kennedy Space Center, 630 miles. That's main engine cutoff. Main engine cutoff. It, it's. Uh, I don't have any information about that, but it wouldn't be too uncommon. You'd hate to miss it. It's one minute away. Main engine cutoff. Uh, the. This phase of powered flight, you feel like you're riding on the world's smoothest electric train. It's not vibrating, yeah. it's not shaking, but it is still pushing on the back of your seat. At main engine cutoff, everything stops. The world Seven is zero gravity. Seven minutes and 52 seconds into the flight, Discovery is now traveling at a speed of 15,000 miles per hour. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, 750 miles. The three main engines have throttled back to maintain structural limits on the orbiter as it reaches its 3G oh, limiting man. load. This is now the point where the crew is feeling... Standing by for confirmation of cutoff of the main engines in just about 10 seconds or so. A little bit of difficulty breathing as the, the uh, G-force pushes you up into the straps a bit. Uh, you get a good sense of that in the simulators, but it's and unique you deal this time. With that? What do you do? Just pace your breathing a little bit and think about it a little bit. You should hear Kurt Brown here shortly confirming main engine cutoff. Discovery Houston, Namino Miko, Ohms 1, not required. Copy, Ohms 1, not required. And main engine cutoff and separation of the external tank confirmed by the booster officer here in mission control. They're now... Eight minutes and 53 seconds into the flight. The crew of Discovery in orbit. John Glenn in orbit for the second time in his life. Currently at an altitude of just about 72 miles. They've had a nominal launch. They're just where they wanted to be. In about 45 minutes, they'll do one on-orbit burn to circularize the orbit at the, right. the target altitude. Um, the mission specialist on the mid-deck is probably unstrapping and beginning to get some gear out now. And the payload specialist will most likely wait until OMS-2, as it's called, is complete in a little while. So they are actually starting work wow. on their mission this close to launch. Well, these folks you see in the Launch Control Center have just finished a very long and intense day's work, and the crew is just starting. And it starts very fast. And just a little over eight minutes off the ground. They're going to work, huh? You betcha. Yeah. Oh, man. I uh... think you're going to miss any of those pictures, Dave? <laughs> no, I just... I just... Well, just in case you did miss it, let's take a look now. I know, this is... Uh... The launch of the shuttle Discovery no. with John Glenn hey. on board. We have a golden star. We have the Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Love that. Do you like that? Six astronaut I, Lisa does a super job on those comments. Roger all this was her secret send-off. Secret send-off with a wonderful sense of style and history. Shuttle Discovery, this is STS-95, 
Let's go to Marcy Fleischer now. Marcy has been at the Astronaut Hall of Fame here in Florida. Marcy, what was the reaction there? Angela, I can tell you my reaction was very emotional. Got some tears in my eyes, a little choked up. I think a lot of people felt the same. They started clapping and cheering. People didn't just come from all over the country to witness this. They came from all over the world. I'm with some gentlemen from the United Kingdom. What did you think? Absolutely out of this world. It really was typical. It was our first launch here. And, well, the whole thing was so beautiful. It was great. It really was lovely. I like that description, out of this world. What did you think? Marvelous. Tremendous. I don't know what to say about it. It's absolutely tremendous. Let me ask your friend right next to you. Was it what you expected? Yes, and more, I think. Absolutely brilliant. Well worth the wait. Wow, quite the critiques. What about you? What did you think as far as when we were in the hold and we got postponed for a couple minutes there? Did you get nervous? Certainly, yeah. There was a big adrenaline buildup, waiting for our own. Was it going to go? Was it going to hold? Who knows? I mean, it was absolutely fantastic, though. What a thing to see. Well, thank you all very much. Andrea, uh, Angela and Dave, that's the response from here. People just really thrilled. And, of course, Will was watching with us as well. He said, oh, is this cool. <laughs> All right, Marcy, thank you very much. Marcy Fletcher reporting from the Astronaut Hall of Fame here near Cape Canaveral, Florida. Now back to Columbus and Kelly Hudson. Kelly, the reaction where you are. Dave, these students here with the Young Astronauts Club, they were counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then the room went up in applause. These students very excited. And Candace Waddell is with me now. She has been a member of the Young Astronauts Club for the last three years in a row, and she also went to the NASA Space Camp. What did you think about this as it unfolded before your eyes? Uh, I was just so amazed. I was like holding my breath when that was going up. I was just excited and nervous at the same time. Now, after that, everything seemed to be safe and the, the speed was mounting. You were still nervous when you walked over here. Why? I was just thinking about how they're feeling right now. They're going so fast. They just belted back in their seats so much. I mean, it's just so incredible to think about. Can you see yourself taking off one day? I don't know, maybe someday. Okay, Candace. A lot of the students here just eyes big with amazement as you all saw it firsthand and they saw it here on 10 TV. And we're gonna talk to them more to see what they think. We'll have more for you later at five. All right, all Kelly, right, thanks thank a lot. Kelly Hudson Kelly. from the Astronauts Club. Yeah, let's go now to the Center of Science and Industry, a place that is near and dear to Dr. Catherine Sullivan and see what's going on with the crowd there. Luann Stoya. We had a great time here, Angela. I want to tell you, a space pioneer is back in orbit. And we also have a first here for Central Ohio. We got to watch it on this high-definition television, and it was incredible. A first for us here in Central Ohio. Some of the folks here came down, watched it on our noon report that this was going to happen at Center of, Scientists, Center of Science and Industry. Tell us what you were thinking when you saw the uh, launch go up. I thought it was good. Yeah. Good to see. Um, Senator John Glenn to go up in space. Okay, and I'm going to ask your brother, what was the best part of the launch here? It was really, really beautiful. And I know it was my first time seeing it, and I wanted to see this in like a long time. Okay. And Mom, I got to ask you, you know, on high definition television, it, it really seems so clear, didn't it? It was so clear. I'm so well, glad we came down. You know, we were watching TV at home, and we saw you broadcasting live down here. We, we came straight down because we wanted to watch with everyone else. It really gives you the feeling of being there. We're at Center of Science and Industry, COSI in Columbus, and it's really a great feeling. The sound was incredible. The whole experience was incredible for the folks here. And really now with John Glenn in space, a Buckeye hero and now a Buckeye legend. Back to you. Thank you very much. And tell the folks at COSI, we will bring Dr. Sullivan back safe and sound and all in one piece. We're going to catch our breath. Ignition you too. and lift we'll off in just of a moment. Stay with, with a crew oh. of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Yeah, that. Hey, good boy. Yeah. So that's oh, what yeah. going to say. Discovery. Look at that. It's like a candle. Roger roll, Discovery. You're watching Mission Discovery, special coverage from 10TV Eyewitness News and the Ohio News Network with 10TV's Dave Kaler, Angela Pace, and ONN's Deborah Knapp. T minus 10, 9, 8, we have a go for engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Discovery launched on his second Ready space out, mission Debbie. in his career, a flawless liftoff for the shuttle Discovery on a beautiful day here at Cape Canaveral and just the, the roar of applause, the roar know, of just, approval that amazing. went up when that shuttle finally did lift off. It was something to be seen and heard. Well, after you see those pictures and you see that the shuttle had taken off, it's all in Mission Control's hands now in Houston, Texas, and that's where our Tino Ramos is right now. Tino? Yeah, Dave, they were really happy to see this thing go. You know, we were watching some of the employees here at the training center. That's where we're located here on uh, the Johnson Space Center. And they had their eyes riveted to the screens, kind of watching, just wondering what some of the delays were. But as soon as it went up, smiles went on all their faces. You know, you were talking to Dr. Sullivan, saying that as soon as they head up to orbit, they immediately are beginning their workload up there. And I want to tell you a little bit here in terms of what we have here, because in the back part of the uh, shuttle here, this will be the space hab. This is the laboratory that they'll end up working on. And uh, probably within the 45 minutes they'll start working their way from the uh, the mid deck which is on the bottom and the flight deck up here they'll start working their way through a tunnel into the space hab they'll be activating a number of things in there activating a number of experiments just trying to plan things and prepare things to get the uh, most of the experiments underway mission control very happy with the way things have gone everything was in working order all the systems uh, kept up through the entire flight at least through the launch area and up into orbit that obviously is the critical stage of this so right now Dave and Angela it's uh, mission uh, they're just getting right into the, the string of things and just trying to get things going to get right into the flight plan of a nine-day mission. Dave, Angela? Right. Hey, Tino, thanks a lot. Tino, will be housed down there at Mission Control during the duration of this flight. That's right, until November the 6th. Let's go now back to Columbus with Penny Moore. Penny has been spending some time with some seasoned citizens <laughs> watching the launch. Penny? You know, we didn't feel the ground shake up here, Angela and Dave, but we sure enjoyed this. I was with about 25 senior citizens here at the 2nd Summit Street Senior Recreation Center on the north side of Columbus, and Paul Strom, who is about to be 90, I watched your face, Paul, and you were thrilled, weren't you? I was. <laughs> Tell me what you were thinking. I was just thinking how wonderful it is that uh, the senator could say a second flight. I mean, he's no, no well known, of course, mm -hmm. around here. Were you frightened for him? Yes, I was. But I didn't, not to his face. <laughs> you wouldn't have told him that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I know there was a great sense of relief when that space shuttle went off, wasn't there? Oh, yes, there? it always is. Okay, That's now you got nine right. days to worry about him. That's what we were talking about with a lot of the seniors here. It's not over yet. Uh -oh. It's nine days up there. Well, it's, their reputation is just un wonderful of uh, both, both uh, Texas and Florida. So yeah. you're confident all will go well, oh, aren't yes, you? yes, I surely am. Thanks, Paul. You know, a lot of the seniors here who have watched all of the space flights, Dave and Angela, do have a great deal of confidence in NASA, although one woman told me as she was watching in the back of her mind, of course, was that horrible Challenger accident, and she was just praying that there would, of course, be no repetition of that scene. So everybody was very happy. It was a great event here. Oh, she was not alone. Thank you very much, Penny. Now we want to go to Marcy Fleischer, who was over at the uh, Astronaut Museum, and our Will Upton from Zanesville it should be. What was his reaction, Marcy? Are you, there? you got him there? I've got him, Dave. We're here with Will Upton, who's a member of the 10TV broadcast team. He was watching right next to me, traveled all the way from Ohio as well, Zanesville. Well, Will, what did you think? I thought it was pretty exciting. It was pretty neat. I liked when the rock was going up. You saw a lot of fire. It got real hot during the launch probably because of all the flame. Okay, Will, we're going to cut you off here, but we want to hear more from you. But first, we need to go to a break. This is live coverage of 10TV's John Glenn return trip to space. Yeah. Once again, you're watching a replay of the successful launch yeah. of the Space Shuttle Discovery, and it is in orbit now, and so is John Glenn, and so are the six astronaut heroes. Just can't get enough of that. I could watch that yeah, over and over really and over neat. again. And I'm sure that Deb Knapp of ONN, who is standing by, she was down by the countdown clock. Deb, where are you now? I'm still at the same place, Angela. As far as I'm concerned, I think we had some of the best seats in the house for this. And, you know, I, I agree. You can't uh, get enough of this. Your stomach could feel it. Your feet could feel it. Your bones could feel it. It was just an amazing, amazing experience, I think, for everybody here. I, I think a lot of the media members, right before it happened, 
kind of were holding their breath. We had those two holds that we had to sit through. We didn't know if it was going to have to stop again before the actual 0-0 zero, zero, uh, appeared on the clock. And as soon as it went off, you just heard cameras clicking, people cheering. And uh, once it started reaching towards uh, near orbit, uh, it just uh, erupted in applause down here. So certainly an experience I will never forget. All right, Deb, I don't think any of us will. And once again, we do want to remind our viewers that this is a joint broadcast effort between WBNS 10 TV Eyewitness News and the Ohio News Network. Back in just a moment from Cape Canaveral. Stay with us. Tomorrow at 6 and 11, winter's right around the corner, and we've all got the same two questions. How cold is it going to get, and how much snow are we in for? How cold and how much snow? What do you expect this winter? Tomorrow, Doppler 10 Chief Meteorologist Mike Davis and the Doppler 10 Weather Team use the most advanced weather system in Central Ohio to give you the lowdown on the winter of 98. Tomorrow at 6 and 11, only on 10 TV Eyewitness News. All right, you are looking at the clock now, and Dr. Sullivan, tell me what that says. We are what into the flight now? Well, you know, with the lighting angle, I know, on that it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? It's a little it? bit hard to tell, but it ought to be something coming up on about uh, 12 or 20 minutes. Okay, 12 so, or 20 minutes. 12 or 20 Give minutes, take. somewhere in there. <laughs> Give or take a couple of seconds. Successful, beautiful launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery with Senator John Glenn on board STS 95, now in orbit. There's something, though, very significant about that clock because when it was nine minutes in holding, there was a special, special message to the crew from Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter. Yes, at this point in the count, it seems appropriate to say to the shuttle Discovery crew, good luck, have a safe flight, and to say once again, Godspeed, John Glenn. Of course, it was Scott Carpenter who initiated that saying when John Glenn went up 36 years ago. Godspeed, John Glenn, and he reiterated that once again today. And you know that meant a lot to John Glenn and to the rest of the Shuttle Discovery crew. Let's go now to Ohio State University where Lisa Kick has been there watching the launch with some Buckeyes. Lisa? Oh, a lot of Buckeyes, Angela. We packed about 150 people plus into Bricker Hall right across from the office of the president. The president, of course, in Florida watching this firsthand. Meantime, students here at Ohio State are just excited that one of Ohio's own and someone that's going to be coming to the campus went up in space as the oldest man in space. I'm here with Donald Joe, who's been here the entire time as we started the countdown really today. And uh, Donald, your thoughts as you watched the Discovery lift off? Well, I just can't believe how fast it just went up there, you know, just like <laughs> Mach 6 at one time, that's about 1.2 miles a second. So I usually, saw, I usually thought, you know, they just get up, you know, step by step, step by step. Watching this, well, giving you a new idea just how fascinating and how adventurous and sometimes how dangerous space travel really is. You know, in 1961, no, well, when Junglin first went up, 62, 62 when Junglin first went up, you know, they say that the Atlas rocket he's riding on, it got like a 40 or so percent chance that we just blew up right on the launch pad. Wow. So. There's a lot of risks involved in this, and Donald, thank you so much for joining us. Some of the folks here, uh, as Penny mentioned, were also thinking about the Challenger, and I uh, talked to a couple of ladies who said, gosh, we're just here to pray and send our wishes to John Glenn and to all of that crew that they get up safely. All right, thanks a lot. Lisa Kick reporting from OSU. Our Chuck Strickler is down at the State House, where some people there were watching the, the liftoff and the flight. Chuck? Well, David, Angela, a lot, a lot of excitement here in the crypt of the State Capitol. I think everybody's heart was in their throats as the countdown approached zero and the blastoff. Maybe people saying a little prayer, clasping their hands, and, of course, lots of cheers when the shuttle did finally take off. More than 100 people here in the crypt watching the blastoff, including these kids from Bluffview Elementary, Judy Tabor's fourth grade class. And let's get some comments from them. This is John. John, how do you feel about being a part of history and watching part of history? I feel very good. I just hope that John Glenn comes back safely. Okay. <laughs> Shanika, what did you think of the liftoff? It was great. It was like just how it went up very fast and how the things fell back down. It was very cool. And we also have David over here. David, what do you think about John Glenn? 
I think he's a really amazing person for going up in space at 77. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, David. And the teacher, of course, Judy, how important is this that these kids have seen this as part of your uh, studies? Well, I think it's just such a huge part of history, and we study Ohio history all year. And we were talking this morning about how the fact this was something they would share with their grandchildren when they got older. And one thing we've really tried to focus on is the fact that John Glenn is a true American hero, and he shows those characteristics of leadership and perseverance and all those wonderful things that we want to instill in children. So it's, it's a great opportunity for kids to learn a valuable lesson and see a wonderful role model. And to see some real life education as well. That's right. Judy Tabor, thanks a lot. And thanks to the kids for sticking around here. Something that they will always hold on to and remember. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot. Chuck Strickler reporting live from the State House. And that's what it's all about, having the young people see history in the making. When we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Catherine Sullivan, get her reactions to today's Discovery flight. Right now, let's take another look at an amazing launch. We'll be right back. Once again, you're watching a re launch. Once again, the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery carrying Senator Gl John Glenn and six other astronauts into space for a nine-day mission. What's interesting about this launch for John Glenn, when he went up the first time, there were no women involved in the program, were there? That's true. No astronauts uh, and nobody on the flight control teams. And in this case, you heard Susan Still, Capcom. She's a twice-flown space shuttle pilot, flies in the right seat, and someday will command a mission. And uh, her boss, if you will, really orchestrating the whole Mission Control Center in Houston for the launch is Linda Hamm, one of the flight directors. And of course, we heard the voice of Lisa Malone from NASA also right. kind and, of walking us through. And of Eileen Hawley, the yeah. voice of NASA has taken on different inflections. And you don't have to put people around the world to talk to the spacecraft anymore. <laughs> That's right. I remember that, like we were talking about the first time when John Glenn went up, he had to, you know, he would contact him in That's Nairobi right. or contact right. him in Australia and in places like that. Take us back to this day. Compare this day, uh, Dr. Sullivan, with, let's say, the days that you took off in your three flights. I mean, was it smooth or was it routine? This was really pretty routine? A, a pretty smooth countdown, very, uh, as the launch control team virtually always does, exceedingly well done professionally. Uh, a few challenges, a few good tests of their skill and their command of the situation. Um, kind of makes life interesting in a way. But, uh, <laughs> They performed superbly. It's just a, it's an extraordinary group of people. Kind of nostalgic right. for you today then, huh? Well, yeah, that's the team I grew up with. It oh, still okay. feels real good to see them go <laughs> through their paces. <laughs> All right, and I know you were with them in spirit. Then. Absolutely. Let's go to Deb Knapp from ONN now. Debra? Angela, you know, the first time John Glenn went up, there weren't nearly this amount of media coverage of it. Today, expecting maybe 4,000 people uh, may have covered the event. And, of course, you can watch this, uh, this over and over again tonight on the Ohio News Network. We do have a special coverage from 9 until 10 o'clock on ONN. And, uh, again, what an exciting time. And everybody's talking about it as they're packing up their stuff and getting ready to go. Okay, All right, Deb. thank you very thank much, you Deb. Much. We want to remind you that COSI will be talking to Senator Glenn from the shuttle, right, Dr. Sullivan? That's right. COSI will have a voice patch, one of only three places in the country, in the world, actually, have a voice patch up to Discovery on Saturday. John uh, wanted to do some educational interaction with kids during the flight, and we were very pleased that he remembered COSI and our role in education okay. in Ohio. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. lot. Back in just a moment. Stay with us. It seems there are still a few cable systems out there that have said no to bringing you the Ohio News Network. No to bringing you the Ohio news, weather, and sports you need, when you need it, 24 hours a day. If you're not getting ONN, call your cable operator. Tell them to fix it. The Ohio News Network, Ohio's own 24-hour cable news channel. You need ONN now. You're watching Mission Discovery, special coverage from 10TV Eyewitness News and the Ohio News Network with 10TV's Dave Kaler, Angela Pace, and ONN's Deborah Knapp. And 45 minutes into the flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery, <laughs> we're still here at Cape Canaveral, but the shuttle is almost halfway around the world. Let's go to Kelly Hudson now, who is with a group of junior astronauts. Kelly, back in Columbus. 
Well, the Young Astronauts Club had to go home. They had to catch their bus. But they were here just about 25 minutes ago. They saw it all. They saw history here. They were all nervous. They were scared. They were hoping the best for John Glenn and the rest of the astronauts. And I think the quote of the day is this. When I asked one of them what they thought about John Glenn, the young man said, he's a really old guy, but he's gotten to live all of his dreams. And it's just so profound from some of these young people who may not have the sense of history, but yet we're a part of history today. And we've captured a lot of the moments that were here, and we're going to bring them to you at 5 o'clock so you can see this launch through the eyes of a child. Back to you. All right. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. We want to say a special thank you to someone else, very special to Dr. Catherine Sullivan, former shuttle astronaut and director of COSI, because we could not have done this without you. Your final thoughts on today's launch. Uh, every launch is a great launch. Every flight is a wonderful flight and a great human adventure. Uh, this is a great crew with a lot of exciting things ahead of them. And I think we all look forward to hearing John's second round stories when he comes home in 10 days. I we want to thank you very it. much thank for you your so expertise. Much. We couldn't have got through this without yeah. you. It's been a pleasure as always. And thanks, <laughs> thanks for the advice. <laughs> Back in just a moment. Stay with us. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Down in history for a long, long time. A very Discovery, successful, uneventful program. launch really here Roger, at Discovery. Cape uh, Canaveral today, and everything is going fine. And what a glorious day. I don't think there could have been a better day for launch in terms of the sun, in terms of the weather, perfect. and in terms of the spirit. Absolutely perfect. And for those of us who are old enough to remember John Glenn's first launch, it's really very special to be here today to share in this moment with Senator Glenn and his family and the rest of America, as well as to wish the rest of the shuttle crew well, too. And Pedro um, Duque, Duque, that's right, right. Pedro Duque, his first flight from Spain. So this, this is going to be a very yeah. special day for him, too. Just absolutely incredible feeling and pictures and sound. We want to thank everybody back at home who helped to put this all together, our crew here, here, folks who have been working yeah. tirelessly, our new friends here, our fruit crew, crew from Florida, I can't even get it out, crew from Florida who's been taking care of us, making sure we have water and towels and job, uh, huh? killing the bugs yeah. for us. It's really been a real adventure working with all you guys too. And again, we can't thank the producers and everybody at home and those here enough. I mean, some of them came down last Thursday and everybody that has set this up, it's absolutely fantastic. Our continuing coverage tonight at five, at six, and 11 o'clock tonight, 10 TV Eyewitness News. We are your 24-hour news source, and we will keep it right here and throughout the mission. And right now, we want to leave you with some memorable moments of John Glenn's life, brought to you by videographer Drew Yassi. You'll Thank you this. very much for joining us. Good night. Good night.